Let us turn then in our Bibles to 1 Kings chapter 19. We return then to our study through the book, well, through the life of Elijah. We'll be looking at verses 9 through 18. This is 1 Kings chapter 19. And there he went into a cave and spent the night in that place. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? So he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. So it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts, because the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. Then the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, anoint Haziel as king over Syria. Also you shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, as king over Israel, and Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of abel Mahola, you shall anoint as prophet in your place. It shall be that whoever escapes the sword of Haziel, Jehu will kill, and whoever escapes the sword of Jehu, Elisha, will kill. Yet I have reserved seven thousand, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. Let us pray. Lord, may your blessing be upon your word now that it has been read. Lord, we recognize your word to be the very voice of God. And as we attempt now to expound it, may your presence be made known to us. and May you open our minds to understand. And Lord, change our hearts that we may receive it, that we might be better people for your kingdom. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. It has been a while since we have looked into uh, anything uh, that has to do with our Elijah series. As circumstances and other things have kind of push things around. And now that Pastor Chris is away, it gives us the opportunity then, since I have Sunday evening as well, to continue and get back into our study, which is a little different for me. Uh, each sermon is usually about a month apart, because Chris will take one Sunday morning, and I'll take it the Sunday night for once a month. So uh, we have to be a little patient, and maybe try to dig into our memories a little bit to remember what was taught the last time, but just as a little bit of a refresher, we'll look into it. If you recall, I believe I preached on a Sunday morning, Elijah's challenge to King Ahab and the false prophets, the prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel. The prophets attempted to call down fire from heaven in the name of Baal. They could not. Uh, Jehovah's answer with fire burned up even the water that had been around, put, put around the altar into the trench that Elijah had commanded. And then at the end of that, we, we saw the slaying, I believe it's the 450 prophets of Baal. I get the number 400 and 450 because there's two different groups mentioned there. But I think it was the 450 prophets of Baal that were slain by Elijah. And that was, of course, done in obedience to the scriptures, the Old Testament which in God's kingdom, when he had established with Israel that anybody who taught against his law was to be put to death, any prophet. If the prophet prophesied falsely, 
if he told the people to go to idols, to go to other gods. He was commanded to be put to death. If he I made a prophecy and the prophecy didn't come to pass, then he was to be put to death. That would probably clear out a lot of the, the Christian television today as you hear some of the, the crazy nonsense that's going on there. Uh, but Elijah obeyed the Lord and put these prophets to death who dared come into God's land and prophesy in the name of Baal. Uh, we then saw his prayer for rain. And then when it rained, his running before the chariot of King Ahab to announce the end of the drought. And then we saw in the beginning of chapter 19 that we, th we believe that he was in a state of exhaustion. And perhaps he began contemplating some things and he fell into a state of depression. And he got the notice from Jezebel that she was going to take his life. And he, he uh, got up and fled for his life into the wilderness. And then he asked God just to die. I just wanted to die. Uh, God sent an angel to strengthen him there. He rested. He ate of the food that the angel provided, drank of the water. And then he went for 40 days on the strength of that food that was given to him. So I believe it was some type of supernatural food that was provided by the angel. He was sent on another commission. We're not told exactly where. Uh, he traveled 40 days and 40 nights. We, we mentioned and in the providence of God, he ended up at Mount Horeb, perhaps for the purpose of seeking God. This is also called the Mount of God in verse 8. Uh, Psalm 37, 23, The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delights in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholds him with his hand. So we see the Lord's protecting hand on Elijah. Uh, Proverbs 16, 9, A man's heart plans his way, but the Lord directs his steps. Elijah planned to just to, to, to throw it all in, to, to, to give it up. But that was not to be. The Lord uh, directed him in another place. Uh, it was here at this mountain that Moses saw the burning bush. It was also here that the law was given to Israel. Uh, though Elijah was at a low spiritual point, he knew what he ought to do. And when God gave commands, he obeyed. You know, this is, I think, a, a good lesson here for us because we all go through low spiritual times. You know, we, we may have a, a high spiritual time and then all of a sudden we just find ourselves down. You know, and and it just, just things don't seem to be right. And we confess our sins. We go to the Lord to, to help us out of it. What do we do? Well, we obey the Lord. You know, that, uh, I've, I've talked to people before that they're in a low spiritual condition. So what do they do? They start to miss church. They, they skip out on church. I just don't feel like I ought to go. No, no, we need to obey the Lord. We need to come to worship Him. We need to uh, live for Him. We need to read His Word and to fill our minds with His Word. So even in our low spiritual point, our conditions, uh, we're, we need to follow after the things of God. So that's where we find Elijah. And he ends up in a cave at Horeb. And there was safety in a cave. That's where people would flee to. We find that constantly through the scriptures. You have Lot fled to a cave. You had uh, David fleeing to a cave to hide from Saul. Uh, Obadiah hid the prophets in a cave. We find the persecuted, the persecuted saints in Hebrews chapter 11. Many of them hid in caves. You know, and I had a personal cave whenever I was, a, a, I think, an early teen. A friend of mine, we used to get, we would get bored in the summer times. We lived right at the foot of Chimney Rocks in Hollidaysburg. I did, and, and he was just a few houses away. So, what do you want to do today, Jeff? And I, my buddy's name was Mike, and he said, why don't we go up to Chimney Rocks? So, this was before they turned it into some type of a state park. We would just climb right up the, the face of, of not really a mountain, I guess a big hill. If you go out west, they, they laugh at you if you call it a mountain. We would, we would scale up the front of it, go up and sit on the, the rocks up there, look down on the, on the town. And behind there was a quarry, an old quarry that wasn't used in a junkyard. It's all, all gone now. But in there, there was a cave. And we were able to squeeze in and sit there and just kind of meditate in the cave. And, and it was uh, a time we could just sit and talk. And, you know, it was a... Uh, an interesting place. The caves are interesting places. Well, that's where, where Elijah ended up. He would have had the opportunity here to contemplate the events he had just experienced and then 
his own spiritual condition as well. But as he's in this cave, he is visited by the Lord. We look at verse 9. And behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? The word of the Lord came to him. You have the word behold here. Uh, this is not used in the other places where God's word comes to him. But here it is. It's, it, the word behold is look. Examine this. Check this out. Uh, this is used to show something extraordinary is happening. And then you have the, word, the personal pronoun, he said to him. So it's believed that possibly the Lord himself was there, just as he met with, with Moses uh, and, and he met with Joshua. It's believed that this is, this is a theophany or even a, a Christophany, an appearance of the Lord Jesus Christ, of course, who is the eternal word of God, that uh, this, this makes this a very special meeting. Uh, this was for, for, or rather for his calling, God spoke to him. Now this is his resur uh, resurrection, I'm sorry, restoration, and his restoration, God actually comes to him. And he asked the question, what are you doing here, Elijah? Try to, to the, the picture this. You know, this is not, God's not asking, expecting an answer, because God, of course, knows everything. But the, the question's asked, and we do this all the time. You now, if you have children or grandchildren, and they're at a place they're not supposed to be, we ask them a question, what are you doing here? And that's the picture we have here. Elijah wasn't to be in this cave. He was to be out in service to the Lord. There was a battle to be fought. Uh, he was uh, fearful and he ran. And, and now he's, he's still trying to get his bearings. Why are you here, Elijah? You're not supposed to be here. Uh, why are you hiding for your life? Now remember, the, we, when we began the study of Elijah, he introduces himself to the king of Israel. And he points his finger at the king and said, there will, no, there will not be any rain until I say. So you try to picture that. And then the king is searching for him because of what he said comes to pass. We have this drought and the king is searching for him in all the countries around and wants to, to capture him. Elijah was, was at a widow's house. Elijah didn't run for his life. He obeyed the Lord. And he then goes to Mount Carmel, faces down 450 prophets of Baal. And then slays them with the sword. I mean, this is the man we're, we're, we're talking about. He gets word that Jezebel wants to get him, and he runs for his life, and he hides. This is what God is saying. Why are you here? Uh, we have a war going on. There's a spiritual war that you're to be involved in. So Elijah answers in verse 10. He says, so he said, I have been very zealous for the Lord God of hosts. For the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, torn down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. I alone am left, and they seek to take my life. So he sums up his, his complaint. He has been very zealous. Or is that zealous or jealous? I read it as zealous, I think. He said, uh, verse 10. Yeah, zealous. Okay, very zealous for the Lord. He had stood up for the honor of God at every occasion. He felt compelled to speak for God's glory, regardless for his own personal cost. You know, and uh, we, have, we have a man here that, that was not fearing the face of man. And he stood up for the Lord. Yet he believes that his work was a failure. I've done this. And then he goes down the list of why he believes it's a failure. Even though I've done this, the people forsook your covenant. They threw down your altars, the places of sacrifice and worship. They slew the prophets with the sword. They put out the biblical teachers from among them. And all of this was true. But Elijah didn't mention here, remember Mount Carmel. What happened on Mount Carmel? At Mount Carmel, the people then recognized that the Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. Yahweh is God. And they threw out the prophets of Baal. Now, that didn't throw out the political situation. We still had to deal with Jezebel and Ahab, which is going to happen. But the people saw that God, God was the true God and, and not these false gods. And then he says, I am the only one left. Once they get me... There's nobody left to speak the truth. And that's how he felt. 
And we're going to find out later that uh, this was a wrong assessment on his part. But God was going to teach him a lesson now, and we find that in verses 11 through 13. Then he said, Go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by. So the Lord's revealing himself now to Elijah, and there's some important lessons here, I believe. So how does God work? How can we know when he is present? God reveals to Elijah his error in fearing and doubting the power of God, and now he's going to display it uh, to Elijah. And he passes by with several manifestations. First one we find in verse 11 is the strong wind. And here we have a wind that was so strong it tore into the mountains and broke the rocks in pieces before the Lord. I know we've experienced a pretty strong winds uh, not too long ago. I remember we had, apparently a tornado had gone through. We remember our power was out. I, I don't know if you, if you folks experienced that. Our power was out for several days. Uh, this was last summer, I think. And we ran our generator for a while. It was, it was, uh, my, my neighbor called it Generator Corner because they had a generator and we had a generator across the street. There was two other generators. Only the only four houses in that corner, and all you could hear was <laughs> you could hardly hear anything. Uh, but that was for a couple of days going on. And the the wind was very powerful. I mean, it, it blew trees down. And then whenever I went to work the next day, coming down Cyberton Road, I saw trees that looked like they had actually been twisted. And down Ice Plant Road off of Cyberton, apparently it was a lot worse than that. So we had strong winds there, and the winds that would just rip a tree up and twist it. You know, so the, but this, was, this would have been even stronger because it actually ripped into the mountain itself. And this was the, the uh, demonstration of the power of God, but God himself wasn't in them. And Elijah watched it, but he remained unaffected. We had the same thing with an earthquake. Apparently we experienced an earthquake uh, around here, I believe, uh, New Jersey, and was did anybody feel it here? No, I, I didn't. I, I didn't feel anything. Uh, there was a couple years ago, maybe twenty years ago now. Uh, my wife was in the mall with a couple of our kids, and my my son, he has a tendency to sh one of my boys shakes his leg a little bit, you know. And my wife said, uh, uh, "Daniel, are you shaking your leg?" And he said, "No," and the mall was actually shimming a little bit in, in Altoona. A little bit frightening to be on the second floor of a mall in an earthquake. Uh, so there was an earthquake that came next. Uh, not many things are more frightening than an earthquake, if you're in, especially if you're inside a building. Uh, but God himself was not in the earthquake. We have a demonstration of power at the hand of God, but God himself was not there. Then we had a fire. You know, you have many times before God answering by fire. We saw that on Mount Carmel. But there is this massive fire that, that Elijah observes, but God himself was not in the fire. It's, a, it's the power of God being demonstrated. Elijah remains unaffected. You know, we could probably apply this to our age as well, when you have so many people trying to come up with all of these uh, special type of events, these uh, miraculous things that they want to try to present and they're saying that God is here and, and the, the, the big uh, mega churches trying to get people's attention with all the with pastors flying out of, of, of the, the balconies, you know, coming down as angels and stuff. I mean, all kinds of crazy stuff. People are trying to get, uh, are trying to, to, uh, to get people's attention that way uh, but that's not what we need to do. And that takes us to verse 12 uh, where it says, and after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire, and after the fire, a still, small voice. Now, it does not say the Lord was not in the still, small voice, and we can say that, that he was, because we see with the reaction of Elijah in verse 13. So, when, so it was when Elijah heard it that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Suddenly a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? So there was a still, small voice. And Elijah, when he hears this, covers his face. And we see that, I believe, in, uh, was it Revelation? or no, Ezekiel, Maybe it's Ezekiel and Revelation, where you have the cherubims. That when they're before the throne of God, they use a, uh, their, a set of wings. They have a, wing to, a set of wings to fly with, and they have another set of wings that covers their face. 
you know, that because they are in the presence of God, and Elijah did that, he covered his face. There's something about the voice of God that got his attention. And I believe this is the same thing as what we experience when, whenever we're reading the Word of God. You know, we, we need to be people of the book. Well, when we read this book, remember, we are reading the very words of God. And it, it sometimes becomes mundane to us. You know, I don't know about you, but I've, I've been a, a believer for 40 years, 40 plus years now. I got married 41 years ago, so it must have been almost 46 years ago. I've, I've been a believer. And I've been reading the Bible almost every day of my life since then. You know, and it could become sec secondhand uh, to, or, or mundane. And I have a practice of dating you know, when I finish a chapter. And I can see where I was. This is a, a different Bible. This Bible is only 20 years old. You know, I, I've had other Bibles that I've done the same thing. You know, and I can see, well, I've, I've read this I read this particular book 15 times, you know, since then. Uh, now, when I look back here, oh, I haven't read this one. This was one of those difficult ones. And I, so I go back and I'll read the ones I haven't read. But it can become a mundane thing to us. And we have to be careful that it doesn't. Uh, remembering what it is, that it is the Word of God. And we go to the Word of God not as any other book. You know, I have books that I keep in the bathroom, books that I keep other places, you know, to, to, that we, where we read. And, and uh, you get in trouble if you keep too many books in the bathroom and, you know, you, people want to get in there. But uh, I've found it's a nice place to have a book. Uh, but we don't read the Bible as we do other books. We approach the Scripture as the Word of God. Lord, help me now to understand your Word. As we mentioned this morning, these words go beyond the words of other books. Uh, the, being the Word of God, being the spiritual mind of God, it requires the help of the Holy Spirit to understand. And so we need to be asking God for that and to awaken our hearts, to give us that fire that should be there, recognizing this is indeed the Word of God. And so that, uh, I think how, that's how we ought to approach it. So Elijah, we find, wrapped his face in the mantle. Uh, let's see here. I got off my notes a little bit. So God's presence was not in the sensational and exciting things, but we find him in the still small voice. A believer will hear the voice through the Spirit speaking in his heart through the Word of God, strengthening, convicting, reproving, and changing our hearts. Not through the great miraculous signs and wonders, but through the quietness within our heart as God speaks to us through the Word. The sinner also is affected by the Word. There's two things that happen, that are going to happen to the sinner when they hear the Word of God. Either they are going to hate it, turn from it, or it's going to affect them and they're going to embrace it. If God does the work in their hearts, they will embrace it. Regardless, we need to reverently come before God whenever we open up His Word. Then we find the, uh, the recommissioning of Elijah. This is kind of similar to Peter, if you remember. Peter had fallen. He had went out and denied the Lord three times. But the Lord had prayed for him. And he had told him, this is going to happen. I've prayed for you. Uh, when you return, uh, feed my sheep. And so uh, he, we find the same thing here with Elijah. And so that we have the recommissioning here in verse 13, where he's asked, what, what are you doing here? Once again, this is the second time he asked that. And we have the second time that Elijah answered the same thing as before. He said, then the Lord said to him, Go return your way to the wilderness of Damascus. So I have a job for you to do, Elijah. You need to go back where you came from. Go back the same way. No more running. No more self-pity. It's time to get back to work. Time to get back into the battle. And he's told several things that he needs to do. We have Elijah's threefold mission. Verse 15, that he's first of all to anoint the king of Assyria, uh, Haziel, as king over Syria. And, and this, the story of Haziel, I believe, is in here. I think it was, was it Elisha that actually anointed him uh, under the direction of Elijah. 
of Ahaziel was to be king over Syria. And uh, when this occurred, we, what we have here, we have a man who is not a believer, but God ordains him to do a particular work. And he's, it, some people think that he might be represented by the strong wind uh, that Elijah experienced, but that's, I think, speculation. Uh, so, we, we have God using this man, and I think we have a lesson here as well. You know, we, we think, okay, Lord, we are in a horrible position as a country. You know, we would, it would be nice to have a man to come step forward who is a believer, who will get this country back on its feet, who will direct it, but uh, the person may not be a believer. Sometimes God chooses those who are not to do a work that He commands them to do, that He ordains to be done. And I believe this is what we have with, with Haziel. Uh, 2 Kings chapter 8, we have that in verses 12 and 13. If you wanted to turn there, we have this, this occurring. And Haziel said, Why is my Lord weeping? He answered, Because I know the evil that you will do to the children of Israel. Their strongholds you will set on fire, and their young men you will kill with the sword. And you will dash their children and rip up, rip open their women with, with child. So Haziel said, But what is your servant, a dog, that he should do this gross thing? And Elisha answers, It was Elisha. The Lord has shown me that you will become king over Syria. So Haziel is anointed king by Elisha under the instruction of Elijah. And he is going to be a source of judgment against these people who do turn from the Lord in Israel. And secondly, the second thing he was to do, Elijah's commission to do, is to anoint Jehu king over Israel in verse 16. Remember Jehu, he had, he had a particular reputation. And that was that he was a furious driver. You know, sometimes uh, we, we see people driving, you can say, oh, that must be so-and-so, because look how they're driving. You know, Jehu was the same way. He was that type of a person. He drove his chariot furiously, and perhaps he was the earthquake that was seen. We, we don't know that for sure. What he was coming to do was to knock down the house of Ahab. He was commissioned by God to do that, and he does. We will see that later if you, if you read further on uh, through the book of Second Kings, I believe. He's in also to anoint his successor to the ministry, and that is Elisha. Perhaps this was the flame of fire that was seen. Uh, he would continue the work of judgment begun by Elisha, Elijah, and this ensured that his work would continue long after he was gone. Now remember, e Elijah was one of the few people on earth that would not die. He was going to be taken, he will be taken up uh, in a chariot of fire. We'll, so when we get to the end of his life, we'll see that. But his work will continue through Elisha. And uh, that's another story in itself. And, and I think maybe, Lord willing, maybe we'll get into that in the future. So we see here only a small picture as far as ourselves. We only see a small picture of what our lives affect. You know, as I get older, I see... That uh, my, my children, my children are now approaching, well, some of them are in middle age. You know, they're, they're uh, getting up in years now. And their, their children, my, my grandchildren, are in their late teens. And I'm, Lord, what can you do? I'm, what can you do with me? I'm only here for a short time. I want to finish well. I want to leave an impact. Uh, Lord, I, and then I pray for my children, my grandchildren, for this church, for this community. You know, we need to make an impact, and we need to pray for that, that the Lord would do so. And if we are faithful to Him, long after we're gone, the fruits of our labor will still be seen. You know, I don't know if you've ever planted a tree. I planted a couple trees about 20 years ago on our property, and now they're full-grown trees. Now, if I planted an acorn, for example, a, a, an oak tree, I probably wouldn't enjoy the shade of that tree. Now, I may, maybe in my 80s, I, I might get a little bit of it, but the people that would really enjoy the shade of that tree or it would be my grandchildren, my children and my grandchildren, perhaps. You know, and that's what we need to consider in, the, in our work for the Lord. You know, we, we, we should not become discouraged. You know, we plant 
We plant seeds. And we look around. You know, we all look at tonight. We have a handful of folks here tonight. You know, that, that uh, it, it, it can be very discouraging. But at the same time, we need to remember we're planting seeds. That's what we're, we're to do. We're to be serving the Lord. And in that obedience, He will bless that one way or another. Uh, finally, in closing, we have Elijah's comfort in loneliness. Looking, looking at verse 18. Remember, Elijah, Elijah said, I'm alone. And when they kill me, there will be none left to go on in the service of the Lord. He says, Yet I have reserved 7,000 in Israel, all whose knees have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. And we don't see any of these folks. And I don't know any of their names. I don't think anybody does. That We just know that they're there because God said that they're there. We have 5,000. Is it 5,000 or 7,000? 7,000. 7,000 faithful people who refuse to bow to Baal. And I remember seeing a picture from World War II, one of these Nazi propaganda pictures. And it has this huge crowd of people, and they're all giving the Nazi salute. But if you look real carefully, you see one man like this. He just refused to do it. Now, it was later on when they, they, they published this picture and someone noticed it. They, they found the guy and I think they, the Gestapo got him. Uh, but you have this one man said, I'm not tolerating this stuff. There was 5,000 of them who refused to bow the knee to Baal. And, you know, sometimes it seems like we are all alone. What, what's going to happen whenever we all die off? You know, we're older folks, and, uh, you know, some of us are in our uh, 50, I don't know if anybody's in their 40s here, 50s, 60s, 70s. I don't think anybody's in their 80s. But we're getting older. What's going to happen? Well, we need to be in prayer that the Lord will continue the work in one way or another. And it can be very discouraging. You know, we see all what's happening, and there's practically nobody raising their voice against it. You know, the, the horrible sins that are being promoted and openly espoused by our government. You know, we call them to repentance, but that they just ignore. The Lord will, will deal with them. But we should not be discouraged. We, we may, it may seem like we're all alone, but there are thousands of people just like us all over the country, and we need to keep that in mind. And just closing here with a scripture to remind us of that. If you remember Jonathan. Jonathan is one of those folks in the scripture that you look at the man and you say, why wasn't he king you know, instead of his dad? You know, Jonathan was, was a man who, who really loved the Lord. And uh, he, went, he did a lot of things. Hid, hid David, was a friend to David. But here we have him alone in 1 Samuel chapter 14 and verse 6. Then Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, there was, as a prince, he had an armor bearer. He said, come, let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised, that it may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. You can picture Jonathan and his armor bearer climbing up a hill, you have a garrison, which was a fortress of, of sorts of the Philistines. Many of the soldiers were up there. They look down and they see one man who's armed and an armor bearer with him coming up the hill. In a very bad position to attack an enemy, to, for an enemy to be up higher. But he's coming up. And what's going on here? They meet him and they can't stop him. And he destroys this garrison of the Philistines alone with him and the power of God. 2 Corinthians 10.4 For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God, for the pulling down of strongholds, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So let us not forget that one person with God is the majority, and that we need to not despair, but to continue on in our battle for the Lord. Let us pray.